Good morning from London. This is Bloomberg Markets Today. I'm Anna Edwards alongside Kriti Gupta and Tom McKenzie. With the cash trade just less than an hour away, here's what you need to know. Treasuries drop as the Fed's Christopher Waller says there's no rush to lower rates. We'll look ahead to tomorrow's U.S. inflation data. The S&P 500 gets a late-day boost to finish at a record high. We'll take a closer look at how markets have fared so far this year as we head into the last major trading day of the quarter. Plus, the Baltimore Bridge collapse exposes the fragile nature of global supply chains. We'll discuss with the CEOs of Lloyd's of London and Wizard. In the meantime, a quick check on these markets here. When you look at futures, they are indicated higher with slight outperformance right here in the UK to the tune about four tenths of one percent. Euro stocks 50 futures higher by three tenths of one percent. Anna was just talking about that Treasury sell off. You're seeing the yields on the 10 year higher by we'll call it about two basis points, 420 on that 10 year yield. And of course, moving the dollar a bit higher. That creates weakness in the euro. 108.16 on that currency. Marcus today starts right now. In my view, it is appropriate to reduce the overall number of rate cuts or push them further into the future in response to the recent data. I see no rush in taking the step of beginning to ease monetary policy. Okay, Fed Governor Chris Waller on why he sees no rush in cutting rates. He said he wanted to see a couple more months of data to get to that confidence point and suggested that they could push out cuts further out into the future and suggested they could be fewer cuts priced in. Though he did say that the next move is more likely to be a cut than a hike. But I'm still trying to square this with the dot plots being reconfirmed at three cuts this year and the relatively dovish commentary, frankly, that we've had from Jay Powell. He said, of course, a couple of weeks ago, we are not far from having the confidence to be able to cut. So there seems to be a tension here, either within the FOMC or they're not aligning in terms of the guidance for the markets. Maybe you have a clearer steer. Um, I definitely do not have a clearer steer, but uh, I think what's interesting here is that there's so much emphasis being put on this one FOMC member, and, mm. I, and I think it's simply because back in November, he kind of backed himself into a corner a little bit, similar to the way Jay Powell did, and this is something that the Federal Reserve historically and other central banks don't do. They, they kind of avoid giving exact timing and exact data points, right? They say we're data dependent, but we don't really know what that means. Uh, Christopher Waller back in November said three, four, five positive data points is kind of what you need or what he needs to be more sure. You've now seen two data points in the opposite direction. So uh, that's how markets are kind of interpreting that. He arguably is the most clear to read out of all the FOMC members. Yeah, we talked about this a little yesterday, didn't we, about the divergence, to your point, Tom, about the divergence that we're seeing in the FOMC and the different views on show, although maybe some of the more hawkish language has come to the fore this week with Raphael Bostic talking about maybe just one uh, just one cut this year. That's certainly on the same side of things as Christopher Waller. He really is interesting interesting, though, the way that maybe this sets the stage for that PCE uh, deflated data that we're going to get tomorrow. We know that the Fed watches that very, very closely. If we've got all of this sort of Fed hawkishness in our minds, at least at the margin, you know, just these are Fed voices that are saying we're not going to cut in a hurry. We're not in a rush, to use Waller's words, uh, to do that. I wonder what that means if we do get a hot print on PCE. Does the market manage to ignore it the way that it has done for the last couple of months yeah. in the way that the, the Fed's power has done? Or does the market take that more hawkish line? And does it even matter? now because when you look at the PCE simply because the PPI numbers influence the PCE more than your CPI numbers do. I'm getting really nerdy here, Tom. Bear with me. But this idea here simply that the PPI numbers and the PCE is largely driven by import costs, infrastructure costs, uh, factory orders, things like that. When you look at the nitty gritty, this number that we're going to get doesn't take into account the increase in shipping costs that we're going to get for the next couple of months, the increase in freight, rail, mm. trucking costs that we're going to get off the collapse of the Baltimore Bridge itself, that's all going to feed itself into the inflation data ultimately, but it may take a few months it's, to do it's so. It's going to be interesting that the, the headline data on PCE and the core might go in the opposite direction as yeah. well, and that can mm. you know, cause all kinds of confusion in, in, in terms of the markets and what people are watching for, and all of that on a day when markets are not open in many parts of the world. So you could brace, and the team at MLife have been suggesting you could brace for pretty significant volatility when market when markets reopen next week, given that we have PCE. But also Jay Powell as well, speaking at the San Francisco events. So it's going to be interesting in terms of the language that we've been getting from Fed officials, whether he adjusts on that. I mean, there have been some concern uh, that maybe the loosening of financial conditions is actually pushing pushing things back as well. So the language from Jay Powell is going to be interesting, along mm. with that data. And, and how much of that data, to your point, how much of this data story on inflation is already priced into these bond markets? 
The the interesting piece of that equation, though, when you talk about financial conditions, is you have to kind of uh, so much of it is driven by the stock market and the mm. stock market alone. You haven't taken into account the Bloomberg dollar index yet or mm. credit spreads, which, by the way, a lot of the flows. I was reading a note this morning. A lot of the flows were. Uh, kind of influenced by the private credit story as well. So there's all these external factors that you can't actually quantify yeah. and track by the numbers you see on your screen. You've mentioned this already, how this inflation, you know, conversation around the Fed, it takes us nicely into some of the supply chain issues that we've been dealing with for, in markets over, oh, well, well months, years, arguably. Uh, but now, it, just given extra emphasis or underscored by some of the issues that some of the CEOs that we're going to be speaking to this morning are dealing with, or the sectors they operate in, at least. We'll be talking to Lloyds of London and clearly at the Baltimore Bridge, their marine insurance is part of their business. They've got a, uh, an earning story to bring us as well, and that they've benefited, of course, from higher interest rates and what they're able to deliver for uh, in terms of their investment returns. Also, the underwriting profits look healthy compared to recent years. But it will be interesting to get their perspective on supply chain issues, or rather the impact on the insurance sector from the from the bridge collapse. And then we'll talk to Wizzair, which is not necessarily affected by the Boeing uh, no. crisis, but some of their rivals are, and that could be something to pick up on. Yeah, it's interesting how we're talking about it in, in the context of the, of the Baltimore Bridge itself, but we also have to f fold into the fact that this comes in the background of Red Sea tension. So we're talking about reinsurance in particular. This is building on a trend that you've already seen in the shipping space as well. With Air, again, a similar story, simply because when you looked at Ryanair, for example, they had actually said they'd seen real drop in traffic when it comes to flights going into the Middle East. You've seen similar story coming out of the U.S. airlines as well. So I wonder if Wizz Air is seeing a similar trend when it comes to that region. Well, the, and the, the overarching story for the airline industry, obviously, is the demand and the inability to match capacity with demand. And again, tying to the supply chain constraints, yeah. they face their own engine issues yes. with the Pratt & Whitney engine issue for, for Wizz Air because they rely, of course, on, on Airbus. So we'll be getting an update, hopefully, from the CEO on that front. Um, and then on, on the flip side, of course, it's the challenge around Boeing for other airlines who mm. rely on Boeing aircraft and the fact that they're just simply not able to produce the aircraft that this industry needs right now in the face of that strong yeah. demand. On the Wizz Air specifically, there's also been uh, in the latest load factor data, just a bit of a drop down in the load factor they're achieving in amidst all of that mm. growth that they're delivering. Yeah. So you just want to get a sense of where they're going through the summer as well, um, which uh, perhaps takes us on because that's one quarter. The summer will be another quarter. So let's yeah. if we, we could reflect back on what we've seen this quarter, Kriti, and I know you spent uh, quite a bit of the morning doing that. There have been some some incredible standout new records within the first quarter for certain assets, for gold, for Bitcoin, for cocoa, of course, and in the stocks world for the Nikkei. Everything Japanese seems to do so well. My favorite fun fact came from Tom this morning that uh, a metric ton of cocoa can get you three months of rent in New York City. I would love to go to my <laughs> landlord and say, Just here's some Easter that. chocolate. Here you go. Pretty is right now is dusting off the, her, her suitcase full of kind of cocoa pods. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Just given the Easter candy is so cheap here, apparently, at the moment. Uh, well, I, I think what's, what's interesting in terms of positioning, we talk about the volatility going into next week. For Europe in particular, it's going to be a catch-up trade, given that on Monday the U.S. markets are open, but European markets are not. So the catch-up trade is already there. But going into next quarter, this is, I think, where the inflationary data and even the Red Sea data comes into, comes into the numbers a little bit more. We talked for H&M yesterday, for example, and even they said that even though in the first couple of months of this uh, conflict they hadn't talked about paying attention to shipping costs or Red Sea tensions, et cetera. Now they're saying this is something we're actively going mm. to be monitoring that may affect our pricing. That's just one example of the trend we may see in the next I couple of months. I think it was interesting to see which stocks did well this last quarter as mm. well. And some of them are no surprise, certainly stateside, NVIDIA and the, the strength of the AI story there. But here in Europe, not forgetting what is going on geopolitically on the doorstep, Rheinmetall and Saab, two uh, standout performances in the first quarter. And we know the defense story and the pressure on the European defense story as a result of Ukraine. Ukraine. Yeah, and that story doesn't seem to be going away, does it, in terms of the fiscal impulse to build out the defence industry? So two big names within defence. How much further to run then as European yeah. officials look to build out, that, build out that industry? And, of course, we obsess about the Mag 7, the Magnificent 7 over in the US. But it's also worth noting, of course, that Apple is down, what, about 10% or something year to date. Um, Tesla down close to 30% mm. year to date. So do we get to the point where we need to carve those two names out of the Magnificent 7, bring it down to Magnificent 5? And then, of course, it brings us to the concentration concentration risk story, J.P. Morgan flagging that again. Do we listen to J.P. Morgan, given that their strategists have not been arguably on point uh, in, the, oh. in the last few years? But their point around, around the concentration risks are not isolated, of course, we, to the team yeah. of J.P. Morgan. We've got a couple of uh, guests to talk about the European angle on that, you know, so yeah. away from the MAG7, but talking about the European uh, side of things. And I know we're speaking to Beata Manthi from uh, Citigroup, who'll be talking to us about the Super 7, which is uh, their name for the, uh, for the European names they focus on. If Guy were here, he'd be pointing to his 
What is it? Sensational, Sensational Six. Six. Yeah. Yes, uh, which I think I'm taking over today. We'll, we'll see if I can live up to the to the, to the name. I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the Apple story simply because, Tom, we, we are for the first time seeing this divergence between the S&P 500 record highs and the Apple story mm. falling. The first time, by the way, you see a divergence going all the way back to 2013. Usually they go neck and neck. Apple actually drives the stock market higher. This time mm. around, you're seeing the opposite. The breakdown in that divergence. Okay, we will continue across all of these stories for you today. What else is on the agenda? 12.30 UK time. We're going to get the fourth quarter GDP reading, the third reading out of the U.S. We're also going to get initial jobless claims, so of course, the importance of the focus on the labor market in the U.S. Some reports suggesting there's a little bit of softness in some sectors, in some states. Uh, the initial jobless claims will build out that picture for us. 2 p.m. U.K. time, the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiments reading. It's the March final reading again. Is there any weakness coming through from what has been a relatively strong U.S. consumer still? 5.30 p.m. U.K. time, the ECB's Villeroy will be speaking in Paris. Markets still expecting the first cut from the ECB to come through in June. We'll listen in to Villeroy later today, 6 p.m. U.K. time. The U.S. Treasury market closes early for the Easter break as we look at yields just slightly higher on the back of those Chris Waller comments. Later today, Sam Bankman-Fried, SBF, is set to be sentenced for stealing billions of dollars from customers, marking the final chapter in the FTX case, which took the crypto industry by storm. We're going to be live at the New York Federal District Courthouse. You can catch our special coverage of Bloomberg Crypto from 4 p.m. Mm. London time. And the team in the U.S. have just done such a comprehensive, fantastic job in terms of charting um, this story. And the latest reporting out in the terminal today around some of the context to this is, is a really fascinating read as well. So consequential, of course, not just to Sam Bank for free as an individual uh, and those who may have, may, may, may have caught up, been caught up in some of the losses, but of course, of the, the broader crypto industry at a time when, when crypto is back to kind of record highs. Yeah, that's been a story of the quarter. Yeah, mentioning, yeah. mentioned that, didn't I? Gold, Bitcoin, Cocoa and the Nikkei having a, a record. Uh, well, cutting new records during the quarter. Um, we've got the, the quarterly GDP data out of the US, which just yeah. reminded me that we actually got a confirmation of a final reading on UK GDP. But in case you were wondering whether we were going to revise away that UK in recession story over the last two quarters, mm -hmm. well, we didn't. The, the, the news is that there was no change. So the final reading, minus 0.3% quarter on quarter for that GDP figure. I'm curious how that's actually interpreted, though. Are, are we watching the, the recessionary or not recessionary story so closely? Does the technical recession matter? matter in terms of the pricing in the Very DOE. much in the rearview mirror. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the latest data, or the more recent data, has been suggesting that the UK economy has, you know, some, uh, staged something of a rebound. Certainly Bloomberg econ uh, Economics focused on that composite PMI, saying it's not a perfect read into UK GDP, but certainly the signals there are that we've bounced back into growth again in the first quarter. Yeah, the pound, the pound hasn't moved significantly on the back of this uh, data, as Anna was saying, confirming really what we already knew. 126 currently on the pound. Interesting, of course, to hear from one of the hawks on the BOE earlier this week, speaking to Bloomberg, Catherine Mann, about why she dropped her calls for a further mm. interest rate hike, but still cautioning uh, on, on the inflation impulse here in the UK. OK, coming up on the programme, Barclays says that insurers face claims of as much as $3 billion following the Baltimore Bridge collapse. With firms on the Lloyds of London market most exposed, that is according to research at Barclays, we'll get the perspective from the Lloyds of London market. We'll speak to the CEO at 7.30am UK time. Plus, we'll discuss summer travel demand with Joseph Ferradi, uh, the CEO of Wizz Air. A lot of disruption for the sector as a whole. We'll ask for his experience. If you have any questions for our guests, if you want to get in touch with the team that puts together this program, ID Plus TV Go is the function to use as the sun rises here in London. Ahead of a long weekend, this is Bloomberg. The shifting new world order mm. with China coming up, more disruption, more fragmentation. And of course, if we had, depending on the president, we end up having in the U.S., definitely more disruption and fragmentation. So that's one thing. In that, you also have the long term trend of climate. Right. You have the long term trend of demographics. Those are inflationary. Those are in underpinnings of the uh, inflation. Virginie Masonier of Global CIO for Equities over at Allianz Global Investors joining us yesterday talking about not just the shifts that are taking place in the world's geopolitical order, but how that could actually fuel inflation in the short term, in the long term, at a time when everyone's kind of pricing in those rate cuts, really convinced that the Federal Reserve and its global peers are actually turning a little bit more dovish. Let's see if they're right. Joining us now, Jerry Fowler, head of European Equity Strategy and Global Derivative Strategy over at UBS, joining us this morning. 
The narrative has changed quite quickly, even in just the last 24 hours with the comments we got from Governor Waller as well around pushing back these rate cuts. Are the markets ready for that? No, we don't think so. In fact, it really started about a month ago when we got that pretty hot jobs print in January, which is actually very reminiscent of January last year. If you remember, we got 500,000 non-farm payrolls then. And that really lit the fuse for a reassessment of Fed rate expectations through the second quarter and saw yields rise. So we've just seen the same again, and we've got a fantastic monthly note that we put out that has Nowcast data. It's for a variety of growth-related topics in the US, including non-farm payrolls and also inflation. So we're watching that like a hawk. Uh, for the February data, it was pretty much spot on. For the March data, we've just highlighted that we're expecting still robust jobs, 200,000 more, uh, and inflation at 0.33, which is still running at a 4% annualised rate. So the market's not really ready for this because for the first six weeks of the year, everyone was having a great time. Positions were working, momentum, all of the top global stocks that everybody wants to own, quality, all doing very, very well. But when you look at what works in a higher yield, higher for longer environment, it's value. And so we've started to see a transition back towards value. It's been European banks. It's increasingly some of the energy sector that are more sensitive to rising inflation, rising inflation expectations, rising yields in comparison to the things that have been working so well since yield, yields apparently peaked in, in October. Momentum and quality. Um, quality has already started to underperform. Momentum still has some, some performance that's coming through. Yeah. But actually, in Europe in particular, value has become the momentum trade. It's interesting that we talk about this almost shift to value, and I would even broaden that out to cyclical, even though I know those aren't the exact same thing, but they're close enough. Yes. Uh, They're very CapEx dependent, and and it feels like to have that CapEx spent for a lot of these companies in these sectors, a little bit more reassurance around the start of a new economic cycle would be handy. Is that kind of the thinking there, or or is the CapEx concerns not relevant? No, absolutely. So the consensus is very clearly that this is quite late cycle, uh, and that we will get you know, sluggish growth and weakness in inflation that allows for rate cuts to come through without a significant reacceleration. But we are seeing some signs that business confidence is picking up. We're seeing the, the grease in the wheels of, uh, of M&A and IPOs coming through that's going to keep liquidity moving around the markets. So there is some renewed optimism that perhaps there, there is another growth reacceleration coming, probably more in the US than in Europe, where obviously you can see quite a lot of investment around the AI theme, but also in Europe. I mean, Europe's main theme is electrification. And you've seen very strong performance from Schneider Electric, Siemens, a lot of these plays that are putting cap goods equipment into smart grids and electrification related work. So the themes are there and the performance has definitely come through in those names. Uh, uh, but there are, you know, there are other themes that are coming through at the same time just because there is still not a lot of faith that this is more than a burst of higher for longer as opposed to a, a fully fledged reacceleration. Who, Jerry, who gets burnt then in that higher for longer scenario that you've painted? You said markets investors are not fully positioned for this yet. So where where does the pain point come through? Well, it really depends how far it goes. I mean, investors had a great time for the first six weeks of the year. Quality and momentum were doing extremely well versus value. And most investors generally have momentum, quality, growth type positions. Uh, And they, they, you know, they have enjoyed yields peaking and coming down because it's been a tough couple of years for quality. Uh, But as you see yields rise, that's, um, you know, that puts that, that overweight positioning on quality and momentum at you know, at risk, and value is catching up. So basically, any investor that has that quality growth momentum bias is probably starting to lose out because they don't have enough exposure to, say, banks and energy as more of the value sector. But it really matters how far this goes. I mean, U.S. 10-year yields have fluctuated between sort of 4.1 and 4.3% over the last month. Um, if you continue to get 4% inflation prints and jobs continue to print at 200 plus, there's no reason that yields couldn't back up a bit further to, say, 45 um, uh, and, you know, who knows if they go beyond that. But at those levels, you start to put at risk some of these positions that um, become a bit more valuation sensitive when you've got a higher yielding environment. Let's break down some of the sector calls then mm-hmm. from you and the team. You have an overweight, your biggest overweight on software. Mm-hmm. How much further does that have to run? Yeah, software is a bit of a unique sector because it is actually fairly defensive. You know, they tend to be able to just put, you know, a lot of, a lot of it is subscription based. They're able to put through price increases e- each year. Um, it is an expensive sector. And so it can can be sensitive to rising yields that pressure its valuations, but we just think there's fairly consistent pricing power there. And in fact, as it relates to the AI theme, our uh, Singapore-based tech GPT team in the, in the Wealth Management CIO office have highlighted that 
while there is potentially 60% CAGR growth in AI-related um, products, like semiconductors and infrastructure, there's potentially more like 120%, I think the number is, compound annual growth over the next few years in software mm. as companies start to make use of it. So I think software is still one of these quite strong themes that while valuations can fluctuate, there is there's quite steady structural mm. growth coming through in the coming years. Jerry, you were talking about how growth could reaccelerate in the United States, not necessarily in Europe, although there are growth themes here around electrification, you were saying. I wonder if that is an upside risk to the growth story in Europe that makes us question when we get ECB rate cuts, the fact that, well, there's the, 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 the growth stories that you mentioned for Europe specifically, but also if the US picks up and we see the rest of the world sort of, um, whatever the opposite is of catching a cold, you yeah. know, feeling better as yeah. a result. Exactly. And is that something that actually might even stop the ECB in its tracks? Not from maybe cutting at all, but the extent of the cuts we get. Yeah, possibly. Although the ECB is only running on an inflation mandate. And at the moment, mm. European inflation is coming down quite nicely. So there's still room for cuts. Um, and that will open up an interesting divergence that if the ECB is cutting before the Fed, what are the consequences for the cur currency and how does that impact European equities? But, um, you know, if you've got resilient growth, and actually we've got improving growth in Europe from this point forward and especially into 2025, there's 0.9% of GDP that's being released from the recovery funds this year. So there's quite a lot of sort of um, on the sidelines stimulus that's actually coming through. Um, but all of these things, you know, the, the soft landing narrative or maybe even the no landing narrative is not what the market was pricing last year. And a lot of sectors were priced for recession. So all of those are being repriced for no recession. That's why European banks have done very well. They were priced very cheaply because there was an expectation of cuts and slowdown. That's now not the case. So they're re-rating. You can mm. see the same in US small caps. Priced for recession. Um, it's no longer believed to be happening. And there are signs that there's some outperformance yeah. there as well. Let me ask you about the, the breadth that we see in Europe. Uh, we've got a guest coming up in the next hour of the program who talks about how Europe... We talk about the US being quite narrow. You know, there's, there's not much breadth to the rally. It's a mm -hmm. lot to do with AI and technology. But she points out that Europe has actually been narrower than usual. Does that fit with your findings? And what would you expect to see in terms of how that develops? Yeah, it does. I mean, there's been two very big correlation, sorry, decorrelation drivers over the last couple of years, which have really meant that some parts of the market go up, some go down, and therefore the index is very low volatility. And actually having a low volatility market encourages more risk taking. People either use more leverage or buy more cyclical, volatile, risky companies. And that's been what we've seen in the US and Europe. The drivers are and they're macro drivers. Normally, macro drivers cause lots of correlation. But in this case, it's done the opposite. COVID caused these dislocations within the market between services and manufacturing, which went one way, then the other, other way, and that's starting to normalise. But also, we had a huge yield move. And yields actually have a different impact in different parts of the market as well. Some things go up, some things go down. So this dislocation, I think, is potentially at risk, particularly if jobs data weakens. Because at the moment, you've still got these COVID and yields-driven divergences playing through in the market. That's part of the narrowness that you can see. Plenty of stuff going up, some stuff going down. Uh, but if you start to see those decorrelation macro drivers dissipate, and we expect they will, lower bond volatility uh, and less disruption from COVID, then other macro consequences will cause more correlation. And more correlation will lead to more volatility. It makes it a bit riskier investing in markets. We'll see slightly bigger daily moves. Mm. So our analysis suggests that that will be the case over the next nine to 12 months. But it all depends on jobs. If you have job weakness, you're likely to get a 20% volatility regime. If you don't have jobs weakness, you're more likely to get a 10% volatility regime. So again, that data once a month on non-farm payrolls becomes pretty critical for the, the nature of risk in the market, the correlation of stocks, and therefore that breadth you're talking about. Uh, a, a lot to digest there. I feel like we can game theory this with you uh, all, all day long. Uh, Jerry Fowler, head of European Equity Strategy and Global Derivative Strategy over at UBS. We thank you so much for joining the program. There's a lot to digest there. He talked about the equity story. Let's talk a little bit about the macro story as well. Coming up on the program, you do not want to miss our interview. John Neal joins us, the CEO of Lloyd's of London, talking a little bit about the reinsurance story around not just the Baltimore Bridge, but really building on the defense story here in Europe, the Red Sea tensions as well. We're going to ask him about all of it, not to mention what's happening right here in Europe. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Markets Today. 30 minutes from the start of cash equities trading. Uh, the futures picture in Europe looks 
a little brighter. We are expecting to see a little bit of a bounce, perhaps on the uh, London market in particular. The U.S. futures picture looks a little sluggish. We do get a day before extended weekend feel to market, certainly uh, at uh, this, this early stage of the trading day. We'll keep monitoring the future story, of course. Let's turn to a business that has reported numbers and also has a lot to tell us this week about some interesting uh, news events. Lloyds of London has, by one measure, reported its most profitable year for underwriting since 2007. Its investment returns also benefited from higher interest rates. And as marine insurance is one of its lines of business, the insurance marketplace can also help us understand the sector impact of the Baltimore Bridge collapse. A lot to discuss then with John Neal, CEO of Lloyds of London, who's with us this morning. John, nice to speak to you. Good so let's, we will certainly want to tap into your, mm. your understanding and talk about uh, the, the Baltimore Bridge collapse and what that means in marine insurance terms. But firstly, just lingering on the numbers for a moment. I mean, a combined ratio that's the highest since 2007. So this is a measure of the underlying profitability yeah. of your underwriting business, the highest since 2007. Um, w w what's going right, I suppose, is the question then for Lloyds at this point. So, so uh, well, well, thank you. We've been working really, really hard to get performance back in shape. So good to be reporting growth, good to show improvement in revenue. We wanted to get costs in order and we've also wanted to show leadership. So a lot of conversations with us around diversity, equity and inclusion and around climate. And, and I think I do feel it's really important for UK PLC, you know, because 80 percent of our revenue comes from outside of the UK. So to represent the credentials of financial services mm -hmm. and what insurance can do in the UK is fantastically important. So really, really pleased to be reporting the results that we are today. Yes, because a lot of people ask questions about the role of the City of London, I suppose, at this point, post-Brexit and with uh, the listing story not playing in London's favour. You know, a lot of businesses choosing to either yep. leave or to list in the United States and elsewhere. But, but you feel from the insurance space... London still has a lot to offer. I think it is the only true marketplace for insurance in the world. And we've reported double-digit growth now for three consecutive years. And to give you an idea of where the geography comes from, over 40% of our income actually comes from the United States. In fact, two, two pounds out of three of what we do comes from North America and Latin America. So real geographic spread in what we do, hugely valuable, I think, for UK mm. PLC. John, does the kind of performance that we've seen then uh, over the last year, does that continue for Lloyd's? And what do you, in terms of reinsurance pricing... Uh, they, they're relatively elevated. Does that, how does that story evolve for you? So, so it's, it's interesting. So last year was helped by two things, really. So the frequency and severity of natural disasters, and we'll talk about Baltimore in a minute, was slightly lower than we'd normally expect. So that was good news. And isn't it exciting to actually be making some money on our assets? So we quite enjoy having interest rates. So for the first time in like 15, 20 years, we're making money on both sides of the P&L. Yeah. So we do think the performance is sustainable, sustainable. So there's always going to be a bit of cyclicality, but we don't think this is a one-off. You know, it's been okay. a consistent, steady improvement in performance that we've okay, not, we not Okay, not a one-off. And of course, the interest rate regime is, is likely to change this year. So that's going to that's evolve as well. Let's get to the marine insurance there sure. and this, uh, the Baltimore disaster. We know the bridge was uh, insured. Is insured insured, yep. the, the boat's insured as well. Yep. Um, there's a lot at play here. What, how, how material is this for Lloyd's? Have you been able to put a number on it yet? So from our point of view, as, as you would imagine, we go through multiple scenarios of different type of loss. Do we ever get every loss right and consider every loss? No. But the type of loss that we've seen is one that we would envisage. So we would assume every year this type of loss will occur for us somewhere. Mm. So within our financial considerations, manageable. And you said in your remarks, which is something that's so important, you know, when I think of natural disasters, what upsets us most as insurers is we have the capacity to insure and almost every loss you see is only half insured. Mm. People aren't buying insurance, so we don't do a good, good enough job of selling the value of insurance. In this instance, as you've just said, the boat's insured, the bridge is insured, the port authority's insured. So from a financial perspective, the money is there to deal with the loss. I mean, there'll be the issues of what happened and whose fault was it and all those debates will rage but the good news is this is insured mm. and what, what so to help us understand with your marine insurance expertise you know what are the types of claims then that we're talking about what 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 are the building blocks that we need to to look at to, to add up to the full picture of insurance exposure around this event so, so you've got the easy bit which you can see that you know, i mean these things today play out on our tv screen yeah. so, you, so you can see the damage to the boat you can see the damage to the bridge you know the, the cost of the bridge will run clearly into hundreds of millions of dollars 
as will the damage to the boat. These boats are 400 metres long and 300 metres high. They are vast in terms of size. Mm. So you can see the easy bits. The complicated bits are the supply chain related issues. What impact is this having on the ability for goods to move around the world? What delay and what interruption does it cause? That's the harder bit that takes a little bit of time just yeah. to work its way through. Yeah, just, just back to the sort of the Lloyd's marketplace and its role in this. I mean, analysts at Barclays say that some of the smaller Lloyd's firms may be the most exposed to the Baltimore Bridge claims. Have you, have you estimated that? Have you got anything you can tell us on that so, front? So I don't think that's correct. I mean, interestingly, with um, the insurance of shipping, there are these clubs called Protection and Indemnity clubs there are mm. 12 of them they gather together under the international group they insure 90 percent of the world's shipping and then they buy insurance if you like they lay off with us and others so we reinsure them so there's quite a complex weave of insurers that are involved with this but it's the international group that sits at the bottom of the chain and they will deal with the loss but no i don't i agree with barclays that this has the potential to be one of the largest marine losses in history but no i don't think we've got anything that's that's causing us concerns to think that anyone's... Just quick, on the Barclays point, $3 billion is the number they put on it. Does that sound about right to you? It, it could be. I mean, it's, it's a multi-billion multi dollar loss. I, I think it has to be. But I think it's a little too early to say what do you actually think it's going to cost. But, you know, in terms of the earlier question, do we sort of scenario manage and anticipate losses of this size? The answer is yes, we do. You mentioned earlier that the hard bit to calculate at the moment is the supply chain effects that you see broadly. There's a lot of concern in the shipping space right now that this is one more shipping disaster that we see on top of the Red Sea tensions, on top of yep. the Pan Panama Canal. I, I can appreciate that this is all insured at the moment. At what point do these almost increased shipping risks start to become a danger to you and your company? So uh, they don't become a danger. I, I, honestly, I honestly think we've got to do a much better job of representing how we can provide insurance. You know, when you think of business interruption, I'm getting so old now. I remember, do you remember the floods in Thailand in 2011 and the impact that had people couldn't get the chips on cars. Yeah. You know, you then look at the impact that we've seen in in the Ukraine and you've seen the, the energy impact around the world. So, you know, when you think of supply chain interruption, it, it is all insurable. We can deal with all of these types of situations. So, so I think it's an opportunity for us to say, look, there are products, there are services that can help in this situation. So, no, we're not genuinely not intimidated by the financial consequence. You know, we have the capability, the capacity and the interest to provide insurance. And that's relative to, say, accident protection, for example. What about in terms of actual war zones. We talked about the Red Sea tensions in particular. Lloyds of London active in terms of insurance to Ukrainian shipping, for yes, example, in yes. the ports there. That's a different story. That is an active war zone. How are you approaching it in terms of managing risk there? So it's, I mean, you're completely right. There are two very different scenarios. So when you're in an active war zone, then it takes political intervention to create a pathway and a passage that is insurable. Provided the political intervention is there, we can provide the insurance, which obviously we did in partnership with the UN and 32 million tonnes of grain and fertiliser were moved through the Black Sea. That The Red Sea is not uninsurable, but until there is some intervention that creates security and safety around the passage of goods and people, it's very difficult for us to provide insurance. But the moment there is, there is no lack of appetite to do so. But what do you need for that assurance, especially when the U.S. military is already in that region? We, we, need, we need government understanding and we need respected government on both sides of the equation. So when you look in the Black Sea, you, you did also have the Russians agreeing to the safe passageway and the intention to transport the goods. Right. So we, we, do need that, we do need that dialogue to apply to both sides. Mm. Otherwise, there's just extreme uncertainty around the risks that we're being asked to take. Uh, John, you were talking about not being intimidated by certain global challenges and insurance being available. I mm. wanted to set that in the climate change uh, context, if you like. Uh, we've talked to a number of reinsurance businesses about whether we are in any sense moving towards an uninsurable world in, in either certain geographies or around certain activities as a result of climate change. And they both cautioned they don't like to think of it that way, but it's more about the price that people are willing sure. to pay sure. and, and suggesting that, you know, only now are we starting to see the true costs of climate change being sure. passed on. And, and is that how you, what context would you add around, around the climate change yeah. story? I mean, the good news is talking to an insurer, you're not going to get an insurer denies climate change. We've been talking about it for 25 or 30 years and we have 25 or 30 years of weather related data. So we we can show you the increase in severity and frequency of climate related incidents evidence through weather. I, I think what it needs now when it gets complex, so you think of Florida or California in the US or dare I say something like Queensland in Australia, 
I think it needs the banks, the insurers, the regulators and the government to sit around the same table and say, this is complex, everyone's got a role to play here, what roles are we going to play? Because I think the capacity is there, the capability is there, but it's just not one party anymore that can solve the problem. So, so when it gets really hard, those are the conversations that need to take place in, in, in our view. Mm. John, on the question of artificial intelligence, I want to fold two questions into one. One, what are some of the most interesting use cases you're seeing across the marketplace in terms of how, our, how our AI is being applied with, within insurance across your business? And secondly, are you looking at, will there be products to insure against AI risks? Yeah, that was a great question. So on the first question, uh, data informs everything we do and how we yeah. think. So in, in AI, through various iterations, then it's always been part of what we do. So when you ask questions about how we measure risk and manage risk, that is all data-led. When I look at some of the interesting use cases now, it's how can we more quickly get to the answer? How can we more quickly get to yes for a risk and price it? And AI is hugely helpful in that respect. And I think when you look at the insurance opportunity, you know, when I first started insurance, everything was tangible. Can you insure my building? Can you insure the people that work in it? 80% of what we do today is intangible. Can you insure my data? Can you insure my intellectual property? Hmm. What risks am I facing from AI? And that's as much about the service as it is the product. So how do we help people when they get into difficulty? What does it actually mean? So, so I think the nature of insurance is, is changing with, with the rise of data, the rise of data, the rise of tech. How do you price that, though? You talked about the rise of tech, and, and Tom was talking about the AI story as well. We were talking about geopolitics earlier. Let's marry the two. Cyber insurance is, is very in vogue. Cyber security yeah, yeah. is very in vogue. How do you price that? So, so we are the world's leading insurer for cyber. 20% of the world's cyber insurance is bought and sold at Lloyd's. Um, it, what's annoying is, is that we're not doing a good enough job of persuading people to buy it. So you know, the cyber market globally is still worth about $20 billion. Property insurance in the US is $300 billion. So, so we've still got a job to do to persuade people that there is insurance cover and there is cover that you can buy. And, and we just have to think very, very differently around the types of exposures that we might get. And when you get something like cyber, the real threat is that, that would trouble us is either systemic or state intervention. Those are the bits that would worry us most. What happens if everyone suffers the same loss at the same time? That's where something like cyber is a little bit different to some other categories of loss. But, you know, we've been doing... The first cyber policy was issued at Lloyd's 24 years ago. Yeah. So we've already dealt with 50,000 cyber claims. So we've got mm. quite a lot of data on what happens. So I think we've got quite good understanding of that type of risk. John, quickly, before we let you go, when you talk to the government, when you talk to possibly the opposition Labour sure. Party in an election year for the UK, what is your top priority for them? What is the top message to improve the competitiveness of your market? What are you taking to them? So th there's, there's two points, really. One would be you, you've got to have a plan. You know, some of the plans, particularly around transition-related activity or some of the problems to solve, they're not one-year plans or two-year plans. They're eight-year plans, nine-year plans, ten-year plans. So for goodness sake, commit to a longer-term plan. And then there is the financial muscle from either or the either us or the banks to want to help and support so one please do that and two can we just represent ourselves competitively regulation is important but we've got to have one eye on what a competitive marketplace looks like because we you know we want to stand up don't we we want to continue to be one of the global financial services centers in the world that people look to all right john neal ceo of lloyd's of london we've hit a little bit of everything with you we thank you so much for joining the program coming up we go into the micro jd sports isn't sweating a recent disappointing trading update saying the truth trading conditions will ultimately improve we're going to take a look at that and your other stocks to watch coming up next this is bloomberg Welcome back to Markets Today. Uh, 14 minutes until the start of cash equities trading. The futures picture has looked broadly buoyant for European equity markets. U.S. futures, though, look uh, almost entirely flat as we head into an extended weekend on both sides of the Atlantic, broadly speaking. And so we keep that in mind as we look ahead to important data due out. Uh, right, let's get into a conversation with our Markets Live executive editor, Mark Cudmore, who joins us now. Mark, good morning. So I have to come to you on the uh, comments we got from Christopher Waller, uh, suggesting that he is in no rush. He seems to be putting more emphasis on the inflation data we've had to date and the fact it's been stronger than expected than, for example, Jerome Powell. How much, how much weight do you put on those, those Waller comments? 
Well, he is a known hawk, so I don't think anyone should interpret them too much. But on the other hand, I think he's absolutely right. The data just does not seem to justify the rate cuts that Powell and the committee have stuck with uh, last week and that the market still seems to be pricing. Now, there's a chance the economy is going to suddenly fall off a cliff, but there are really no signs of it at the moment. That the, the December Fed has means we're in a no-landing scenario. If anything, we appear to be kind of gaining a little bit of momentum again. It is a world where stock markets, uh, commodities, we're seeing you know, credit, every single asset class is doing very, very well. And everyone is determined to find vulnerabilities. But there doesn't seem to be an obvious catalyst out there. And I think the macro backdrop is still too strong. And it is too early to fight this supposed bubble in markets. Mm, OK, so that's the, the, the story around the Fed right now. We're waiting for the PCE deflator data, which we get late, uh, tomorrow, of course, the Fed's pref uh, preferred me measure of inflation. And that's when markets are closed. Given we've heard all of this hawkishness this week, how do, you, how do we position for that PCE? Well, so we've seen both Bostock and Waller come up with these hawkish comments, but overall, yields haven't really gone anywhere in the week. It's been, a, it's been a very much a low volatility market. Of course, PCE can, can cause some volatility when we come back into markets on Monday morning in Asia, where we're going to really see the reaction. Um, but I, I think it's being, it's being overhyped as a catalyst. It's a very important data point, but I don't think we're in a situation where one data point is going to derail the narrative. It's only going to cause short-term volatility. So I think the hype around PC is perfectly in fitting with this kind of general market where participants are casting around for any possible catalyst to derail us and come up with nothing good. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks to Mark. Remember, Mark is live executive editor, Mark Cudmore. Remember, you can get up-to-date analysis and insight with Mark and the rest of the Markets Live team. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. Let's get into stock specifics. Joe Easton has a briefing from our equities team. Joe, good morning. Morning, Anna. So the UK retailer JD Sports says sales will grow very slightly this year, but does reiterate that it's a challenging market with weakness, particularly in the UK, where like-for-like -like sales did actually decline in the last quarter. Now, the US holding up pretty strong, which is quite surprising, given that's where all the weakness has come in this stock. We saw a massive profit warning from them just a couple of months ago. That was related to their North America sales and also due to weak results from Foot Locker, Nike. All of that had weighed on them. But a lot of analysts are saying that this stock should recover. So as we can see, 12 buys, only one sell on the street. But JD, pretty mixed and some negative calls on that one this morning. Then in the chip space, we got a profit warning out of Soytech in France. They make materials that go into iPhones and other smartphones and PCs. Far below expectations in terms of the guidance. Sales in the first half could drop by 15%. Consensus was for nearly 30% growth. Morgan Stanley writing that the decline in handset demand has been far longer than any of them had expected in terms of the analyst community. So we're going to keep an eye on a bunch of stocks that supply iPhones and also PCs as well. We've got Varta over in Germany, AMS Osram, SD Micro, a bit of a bigger one there. All of them having a weak year to date, and this is a negative indicator for that sector once again. Then over in the airport space, we've got France's Vinci and Spain's Aena, both <laughs> vying to take over Edinburgh's airport for more than £3 billion, according to a Bloomberg exclusive. The privately held owner has had it since 2012, but they're looking to offload it. It's the UK's sixth largest airport with 15 million passengers flying in and out of sunny Scotland every year, according to the company. These stocks are actually doing pretty well at the moment, given the rebound in long haul travel. Vinci already has Gatwick Airport, Aena does Madrid, so they're looking to add to their airport portfolios. Keep an eye on those stocks today. OK, Equities reporter Joe Easton, thank you very much indeed. Now, one of the top red stories on the terminal right now is around the corporation that is the stock that is Novo Nordis, of course, and that was the stock of the year, arguably, in, in, in 2023. And, of course, it, it continues to post uh, fresh eyes on, of course, all this demand for Ozempic uh, and, and WeGov and some of these weight loss drugs. But the reporting is suggesting that the profit is maybe a little excessive for Novo Nordis. So some research has been done, some academics. 
and how it's feeding into the debate in the US. Yeah. Stateside could become a, a political issue. Yeah, this cites some research by, I think it's Yale, King's College and others that talks, they've done some research on the, what it actually cost, you know, cost price to put together mm. a Zempic by dose or, or monthly and they work out you could do it for $5 a month but actually mm -hmm. yeah, being charged $1,000, nearly $1,000 in the United States and clearly, uh, you know, businesses set out to make money but they're asking questions about whether they set out to make, should set out to make this much money in this space and politicians have been jumping on this story. There's two ways to view this, right? For the, the company and the stock itself from an investor standpoint. On the one hand, the bull case here is what a margin, $995 mm. per mm. injection. That's enormous. And, and, and therefore, you could actually see oh, that. Per month, yeah. Right, could actually see that react in, in, in the opening trade when you see that kind of margin. I don't think we've gotten numbers exactly around that, given that Novo has been so much CapEx focus and spent. The other side of this equation is, yes, the politics and yes, the regulatory action, which fairly enough takes time. There's also a consumer question there. Are people willing to pay up for mm. a product that they may not see the need to pay up for? And does that, is there some sort of sensitivity around that now that it's been revealed that's really only a $5 You can product? certainly see it riling both sides in the politics yeah. and the political landscape of the U.S., particularly given that Europeans are paying far less for yes. this drug than the Americans. Of course, it's a, Danish, it's a Danish company. The company would say, we don't get to this point. We don't get to these kind of miracle drugs without the massive input in terms of spending around yeah. R&D. They're building out these facilities, exactly. the capacity, the capex. It's enormous, the yeah, spend. I haven't seen, yeah, we haven't seen the workings of what this Yale and King's College report yeah. includes in that $5 a month cost. You know, does it include all of that R&D up front or, does it, or is it just talking about the cost on the production line, which is a very different story? And then there's a the question of patent production as well, right? Because Novo was the first to come to market with this kind of drug in, in particular. They can actually basically claim that because they brought this onto the market in the first place, therefore they have some sort of patent protection for a couple of years until it is more mass marketed. To me, I think the most interesting analysis around Novo Nordis actually came out of Goldman Sachs, excuse me, Morgan Stanley, where they had said that if enough Americans buy into this product and you actually really see the obesity drug explode, that can actually add to GDP growth as well, just because of this product. And I thought that was a really interesting uh, kind of best case scenario coming out of Morgan Stanley. Okay, so we are just minutes away then from the start of the European Equity Trading Day. The futures picture, as we mentioned, has been looking kind of buoyant, but, you know, maybe we see low volumes today. We know that certain people are getting ready for a long weekend and, uh, of course, taking the opportunity to take more time off. So we could see low volumes in markets as we will be closed on both sides of the Atlantic tomorrow. And some markets, of course, here in Europe close on Monday as well. So we keep that in mind. U.S. futures flat to negative. We'll be back with the European Open. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Marcus Today. We're just a few minutes to go until the start of cash equity trading. It kind of feels like people are already on that kind of long holiday mindset. I know I am. I know Anna and Tom are for sure uh, going into mm. what's supposed to be a very exciting day in theory. Here. I know. I know. Am I, <laughs> I'm I, taking off already. We're, we're all on holiday, Fair which enough. is the timing is kind of a little wonky here. Tomorrow we've got that PCE data. We've got chair, comments coming out of uh, Chair Powell as well. Euro inflation data coming out as mm. well. And the markets can't do anything about it. I remember days where they used to move those releases to days when trading was happening. You know, yeah. things that usually happened on a Thursday would happen on a different day if mm -hmm. there wasn't going to be any trading. But mm -hmm. apparently PCE not, uh, not getting that treatment. And MLI's Mark Cranfield, or Mark Cudmore, I should say, saying, look, maybe we're overhyping the PCE. I'm not so sure. Look, it's going to come in. Uh, it's, it's stickier is the expectation that would reinforce what we've been hearing from yeah. Bostic and, of course, um, Chris Waller most recently. And he suggested you can push those hikes further out. He's not mm. saying that uh, those, those cuts. He's not saying a cut's not going to come. He just says you can push them further out. He's not convinced. He needs a couple more minutes, a couple more months. I don't know if we'd of, overhyped of it, but in a quiet week, you know, this kind of data break gets more of a mention. Oh, Guy was talking about it on Sunday night <laughs> about how exciting Friday was going to be, and he's not even here to witness mm. the excitement. Uh, the the interesting thing I think perhaps comes in today's market open when you look at some of these individual stocks. I mean, um, yes, we're all waiting for the macro. Some of these uh, traders are probably likely checked out. There's a couple of names that are already catching my eye. Uh, DHL, for example, uh, getting uh, Deutsche Post, excuse me, getting cut to a hold from buy at Deutsche Bank. Mm. ASML, we always like to watch some of those big heavyweights. Uh, conversations happening between the Dutch Prime Minister and China around yeah. tech security. Does it have a read across into the market open? Yeah. We'll find out in just a few seconds. We absolutely will. Market's uh, opening in just 
just a couple of seconds then. Yesterday was dominated by strength for the retail sector. We'll see what does it today. So we're open across the European equity markets right now. Only the FTSE 100 and the Zetra DAX actually printing earlier than uh, perhaps usual. The retail sector then, as I mentioned, did really well yesterday. It was up 2.5%. We had the likes of H&M really moving higher, more than 10% higher, in fact, in session yesterday. And so that was certainly an area of uh, a focus for us. So what does the market do today? Well, early signs are that we have travel and leisure moving higher as one of the sectors to watch. Basic resources also doing pretty well. And only a few sectors in negative territory. So broadly positive. Stock 600 up by two tenths of a percent this morning. Yeah, we should mention that Lloyds of London is uh, not only one of the highest index contributors, but one of the high percentage movers as well, higher by about 1%. We just had the CEO mm -hmm. on talking about those record moves. Uh, they are given just their marine mm -hmm. time insurance. They're seeing a lot of that uptick in their numbers as well, not to mention uh, not to make kind of good out of a, a poor situation, but some of the costs around the Baltimore Bridge collapse, the Red Sea tensions as well, uh, they are actually able to deal with that and not have to... Uh, uh, kind of shell out too much more than they had anticipated. Yeah, um, he did, he did say he thinks that. it's going to be, it's likely to be one of, if not the biggest marine insurance claim that, we, w that we've ever seen. But specifically on their business, as, as you say, they've had a very good year in terms of 2023. And it was interesting, he was talking about that outlook. He says it's not a one-off. They mm. expect to post and they're in a position to continue to build on that uh, in 2024. Absolutely right, of course, Anna, to focus in on the top sector being basic resources. We have seen a bit of strength coming through for the commodity space uh, this morning. Iron ore prices having skirted with that 100 level are at 101, up just five tenths percent. And Brent oil is also high, as is copper, just by a smidge. So a little bit of movement in, in the materials, the basic resources space, the commodity space, lifting basic resources. So that's playing into, of course, what we're seeing on the FTSE 100 that is exposed to some of those miners. The FTSE 100 up three tenths of percent. Yeah, the FTSE is a little stronger. The, we have that yeah, modest sense of improvement across European stocks today. It's kind of broad-based, isn't it, as, as we've been mentioning. A lot of these sectors um, in positive territory this morning. Only, as I was mentioning, just a couple were moving lower. In fact, three sectors moving lower. And the US futures picture, though, looks broadly unchanged. Uh, just uh, a, a word on the uh, yeah, basic resources, then. The best performing sector, mm. eight tenths. Struggling for interesting things to say about this market this morning. Yeah, no, that, frankly... seems to be, that seems to be the story. You got some of the heavyweights moving higher as well. Uh, I just want to quickly correct what I said earlier. Lloyds of London is not listed. Apologies. We're looking at Lloyds Bank instead. So you're actually seeing a lot of the banks higher as well. Uh, Barclays, for example, trading higher as well as is BNP Paribas. So you are seeing perhaps a rate story. I'm curious if that's kind of some sort of reaction on the hot, little slight tick up higher in yields we got off of the Waller comments, uh, stateside, but also in Europe as well. Again, it feels more like a macro story that's reading mm. into some of these stocks. It's interesting. There was that uh, red headline earlier on about uh, China and Australia being on better terms around wine. And, uh, you know, you might not see there's much direct read across from that into um, uh, into to commodities, but the fact that basic, I mean, basic resources do trade around sentiment towards China and global yeah. trade and, and as well around um, metal prices, we, we don't see a great deal. We see a bit of upside on iron ore this morning, so it could be that. So a Australia produces this higher grade iron ore that China China's reliant on, so they, mm. so they never cut off, they never shut the doors to, to that yes. uh, input, but they did certainly put the put the constraints on in terms of other trade inputs from, from Australia. You had the Labour government come in, the relationship has thawed, and you're right, in terms of the symbolism, it's important. Of course, yeah. it's important for the domestic wine industry of Australia. It was a massive market. It was the largest market, China, for the wine industry. So that's, that's important for them. But it tells a bigger story about yeah. China at least trying to find areas in relations with some of its trading partners. Yeah to ease some of those tensions and to kind of put a floor, at least, under those go. relationships. We found something interesting to say about this morning's market. Better mood music around yes. China. Thank God Tom McKenzie was here, because what would we have done <laughs> otherwise? Not uh, Australian wine and China. Uh, it, Tom's expertise, clearly. <laughs> uh, well, let's go from the micro then to the macro story, because we're talking about these individual European earnings stories. Is there more upside, given that in this last quarter, was the last day of the quarter, we actually already saw the stock 600 hit? that record high. Take a listen to what Goldman's Sharon Bell had to say on that earnings story. She recently just upgraded her forecast for the index. In Europe. It's not that you don't get any earnings growth this year. We do have a little bit of earnings growth, but it's kind of low single digit earnings growth this year. It reflects the fact that the cycle is going to be a bit anemic, even if you do see some recovery. Um, we're looking at less than 1% sort of GDP growth for Europe this year. So a little bit of, it, a little bit of it, uh, earnings growth, but quite anemic really. And yeah. most of it is valuation. Sharon Bell there of Goldman Sachs talking about us. Now we're going to get a little bit more context here. Beata Manthe, head of European Equity Strategy, joins us coming out of Citigroup. Beata, you and Sharon both upgraded 
at the exact same morning. Uh, and we happened to have Sharon on set. But what I thought was interesting is that your reasonings were so different. Uh, she was talking a little bit more about valuations, et cetera. You were talking specifically also about the earnings story and the earnings growth. EPS, I think, was one of your standouts. Walk us through why you're so bullish on European stocks right now. So we've been very bullish on European stocks already before the upgrades that, 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 that has just happened. But so we've been highlighting the balance of risks improving and this early cycle environment, potential further broadening in the market that should be really conducive of cyclicality, and not only Europe, but markets that have more cyclicality within their sector weights. Um, but the reason we coincided with Sharon is probably she was thinking about um, the, the very dovish Fed encouraged us, and I'm yeah. pretty sure that that was the trigger um, for her upgrades as well. So basically what we've heard, don't worry about the rates, we'll cut the rates, the economy is looking okay, we are upgrading the forecast, and we don't worry about inflation so much. So what more do you need for cyclical markets than that? That is a pretty good setup. And add to that a, strength, a weakness in the dollar and a strength of the local currency, it's a pretty good picture. Now on earnings, I agree. If you compare European earnings to the US earnings, of course they are much lower. So our previous EPS forecast was for 3% growth, very low. Now we got encouraged by continued upgrades from economists. Yes, growth is going to be below 1%, but it's every month is a bit better than we thought it would be. And that, of course, feeds in into my top-down models. So now I have plus 6% EPS growth for Europe. And we've been arguing for some time, markets have been pricing in, not so long ago, a contraction in EPS, and now the market is pricing pretty much in line uh, with our top-down forecast, which is slightly below the analyst. It all makes sense, except for that very first thing you said. Hmm. The, the early cycle is, is what you call it. We actually just had Jerry Fowler and, uh, mm. over at UBS join us this morning mm. calling it a late cycle dynamic, but still saying that you were seeing value and cyclicals kind of outperform. What is the indication to you that we are early cycle and not late cycle? So look, it's been a very desynchronized cycle. You could almost argue, I would push it even f further, we don't have a cycle anymore mm -hmm. as we've been used to, right? But in Europe, of course, in the US is a different story. In Europe, we are coming from very subdued growth environment, flat GDP last year. EPS actually contracted by 5% and by double digits, excluding the strength in the, in the banking sector. So it's been a very but underlying year for fundamentals. Therefore, it's easier to argue that we are coming up from low levels, central banks are cutting. This is for me early cycle dynamics for Europe. Mm. So a very strange cycle. And what do we know about the level of concentration that we're seeing in European stocks? Because you've mentioned this in your notes, Beata. I think it's interesting. We talk a lot about too much concentration, or, or, or some people don't think too much, but just a lot, in the United States, in the S&P, for example, or, or even in the Nasdaq. But we don't talk about it much in a European context. Is it, it's not driven by the same sector, is it? By tech, I don't imagine so. So what is driving that concentration in Europe? So what is very interesting is that Markets around the world went up strongly year to date, but through narrowing, so through mm. concentration into a few stocks and sectors. And when markets narrow, they tend to narrow into growth. So in the US, it would be mostly tech. In Europe, it would be uh, luxury goods as well on the top of tech and more recently, even European banks. But we've had this concentration for two months. Concentration doesn't mean that the market has to come uh, come down of the cliff, right? So the, actually the very uh, bullish uh, positioning in the US has just come off at the beginning of this, uh, of this week without the market collapsing. Mm. So do you expect that to, uh, do you expect the, the European market to broaden? So our base case for this year what was for the continuation of the broadening, just as it happened uh, in the fourth quarter of last year. Of course, this narrowing was very unusual for Europe, hardly ever happens in Europe, happens much more often uh, in the US. So a more natural environment for Europe to outperform mm -hmm. is really through broadening. And we are st starting to see very tentative signs that this is, this is starting to happen right now. So, yes, broadening going forward. Uh, Beata, Kriti went to your first answer. I want to go to your first answer as well, because you talked about the dovishness coming through from central bankers. You can look past and we can become less concerned about inflation. But is that the message that we're getting from Chris Waller? Is that the message we've had from Rafael Bostic? It doesn't seem so. Does, does, the, does the message from those voting members of the FOMC 
challenge that view? I think we are going to have a lot of news flow that will be challenging the, the view for sure. But we you really... You don't get a weak dollar in we, that environment. We, yes. You don't get a weak dollar in that environment. I mean, if Chris, if Chris Waller is, is, the, is, is our new guiding light, then we're not looking at a weak dollar. So, first of all, we really focus on what the Chair Powell has said, okay. right? Uh, and what the dots are telling us. Mm. So the dots stayed the same. That was encouraging and that was always the risk they would come lower. So I think this is what the markets leaned on to. Now, on the, on the dollar, we have a bit of the weakness. I think the risk on environment is it's enough for equities outside of the US for the dollar not to strengthen further. So we do not have huge weakening uh, in the dollar, but some over the next uh, two quarters or so. OK, you're overweight continental Europe and emerging markets. You're underweight the UK, Beata. How does that, does, does the UK not have a cyclical, you, fa you favour the cyclicality of this market. Does the UK not have a role there? It does. 50% of the sector weight comes from cyclicality, mm. but it's very skewed towards commodities and especially the energy sector, while the, another 50% is purely defensive. So it's a very interesting and unique market from that perspective. So um, what the UK really needs is for the commodities to start picking up. This will be a better setup for the UK market, does for the FTSE 100. Does that not eat into the bottom line, though, just given that there is that dependency? For example, hypothetically, for I think the very first time in months, we've heard JP Morgan float the idea of a $100 oil, for example. It's not their base case, but they said it's a possibility uh, in, in kind of the worst case scenario. Does that kind of spook you in any way in terms of the bottom line for some of these European companies? So 100 dollar could be a risk, especially for the inflation, right? right. Circling back to the, to the central banks. It's been coming up gradually, mostly because actually the demand around the world is better. So it's a lead indicator that actually the yeah. global growth is not so bad. And of course, it's a function of, uh, of size, uh, some supply constraints as well. Um, it all depends how it goes up, right? How fast and, and to what levels. But a bit higher, um, a bit higher oil, I don't think should be a problem at that point mm. if the growth continues to pick up. Uh, economic yeah, growth. Yeah. I, I want to ask about the significance of real wages in 2024, Beata. Is this a, an upside risk for, for growth, for all kinds of dynamics within the European economy, maybe? Uh, we, we saw the UK retailer Next talking about this some time ago. Uh, today, we've, uh, then we got H&M numbers yesterday. They were strong. JD Sports numbers seem to be strong, as if there's something propelling these retailers at the moment. And Next certainly was talking about the real wage story. That's just very UK. But there, that, that seems to be a conversation we're having in other geographies as well. So wage growth is always the risk for inflation and for the central banks again, but uh, and could put some pressure on margins. But as long as earnings pick up or don't control really proper margin pressures, you only get when the earnings collapse, right? We don't see that on the horizon uh, at the moment, but definitely a risk. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's not play it down. A lot to digest. We've thrown a lot at you. Beata Mant, the head of European equity strategy over at Citigroup. We thank you so much for joining the program. She's talking a little bit about how do you look at some of the even concentration risks, how you look at some of the indexes. Well, I'm going to put my Guy Johnson hat or Guy Johnson tie on perhaps today and look at the sensational six, his sensational six, where he likes to look at kind of the bigger heavyweights, the kind of sectoral picture that we really look at today. It looks like it's all green on the screen, except for Novo Nordisk, which is interesting given that we were talking about that margin story that they potentially are selling a, a drug for about $1,000 per injection that could be made in about $5 according to one medical review. The rest of the heavyweights, LVMH, for example, ASML, even Schneider Electric, which we had Jerry Fowler on earlier talking a little bit about the AI read through there, all higher by over four tenths of 1%, leading the index higher as well. So that is your quick check on the sensational slicks. Let's get a couple more sensational stocks here. Joe Easton monitoring those very, very closely. Joe, walk us through it. Sensational ones in the UK at the moment are in the retail space. Both JD Sports and AO World gaining. Both of them are recovery stories. JD, we had in stocks to watch. They have reiterated some of their top line guidance and a bit of a relief, seeing as we had a massive drop from them in January. The sales are providing some support in terms of the American sales, where the strength seems to be. The UK actually looks pretty weak in terms of the profit guidance. That was up 17% at the open. It's come back down to 8%. Now, in terms of AO World, this is white goods, dishwashers, fridges, that kind of thing. They've had a terrible run, but 
Again, it's more about no downgrade to profit, so therefore some relief in the stock coming up 13% this morning. We'll take a look at the chip stocks. We had that big warning from Soytech, and that one is getting absolutely slammed over in Paris. It's down 11%. It was down 15% at the open, much worse than expected, according to analysts at Morgan Stanley. And it is in the iPhone and smartphone area, semi-supplied into there. So we're actually starting to see a bit of a read across now, coming into some peers. Varta in Germany, they make the little batteries that go into AirPods and AMS. They also uh, supply iPhones, as does SD Micro. All of those coming down a bit of a read across, despite that positive update from Honhai over in Asia, the big iPhone supplier. In terms of deals, we've got the latest UK takeover. This company, Spirit, it makes equipment for the telecoms area. They've got a second bid, previously agreed to take over, and they've actually got a new bid above 200 pence a share, and that stock gaining 10%. Casino, that's in and out of a trading hole. It's resumed trading after a long period of suspension. The takeover by Daniel Krasinski has been finalised. It's very, very messy. It's down 50%. It will take a while to understand what's going on there, but it is a dilution of shareholders following that takeover. And Embracer, this is over in the video game space. They're doing a deal. That stock was up around 8% at the open in Sweden, but it is actually coming down a little bit now, doing a 460 million deal with Take Two in the US. Finally, we're keeping on the theme of Lloyds of London insurers. We've got an upgrade for Score, very timely given your interview just now. A hard market, strong pricing in the Lloyds of London market means Score gets an upgrade at HSBC. And a lot of focus on that given the mm -hmm. events of the week. That stock up 3.5%. HSBC upgrades it to buy. OK, Joe Easton, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And some of the stocks on the move for us this Thursday morning. Coming up, the world's biggest banks quietly hang on to carbon-intensive clients exposing cracks in the world of climate finance. That story is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. This is Markets Today. 20 minutes into what feels like a bit of a sluggish session as we head towards a long weekend here in Europe and also in the United States. But we do have some upside on European equity markets, just up a tenth of a percent. The German market underperforms. The FTSE outperforms retail, the best performing sector, as we saw yesterday. Some of those retailers <coughs> doing pretty well. That seems to be a bit of a theme of the week. Time for your Bloomberg Big Take story now this morning. The world's biggest banks are quietly hanging on to uh, carbon intensive clients because of what they see as unrealistic demands from regulators and civil society and the threat to their fees, of course. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Alistair Marsh. Alistair, the fees were always going to get into the story somewhere, uh, but it is to do with other things as well. Um, and, and you've got some really interesting ways to illustrate where this story is going. But let's start with, you know, it's been three years since most banks made commitments around climate. It's been a big focus for the sector. So what progress has been made? Well, in the real world, emissions have gone up year on year, every year, to record highs, and banks continue to funnel billions of dollars into fossil fuel clients. So you could draw your own conclusions that the energy transition is not going that smoothly. And even if you look at what recently the CEOs of some of the big oil companies, the Exxon and Aramco, were saying, is that actually we need to put more money into oil and gas. To, we're going to be needing to rely on oil and gas for a lot longer than we'd thought, and we need to keep pushing money there. And that puts banks in a bit of an awkward position because they've come out with these climate commitments. They've said we're going to get to net zero by 2050, but actually the progress has been very slow. Some could say that the expectations were too high for banks and what banks could deliver on, but so far progress, there's not that much to show really. Can you connect the dots for us, though, how a bank gets involved in energy transition? I, I, don't, I can't even understand that relationship. Well, the cost, the price tag of the energy transition is like 5 to $10 trillion every year. That's the money that's needed to wean us off of fossil fuels, to build a kind of low carbon energy system, to build low carbon transportation, you know, aviation, steel, cement, all the things that kind of make up our economy. We need to get off fossil, a fossil fuel base onto a kind of clean energy base. And that's going to require a lot of money. And the governments don't have that money, or most of that money needs to come from the private sector, from 
banks and from investors. And that's kind of the role that they play. And they've pledged that they will support that transition and that they will align their lending portfolios and their financing businesses with a 1.5 degree outcome with net zero. And that sounds easy on paper, but in practice it turns out to be fiendishly difficult, not least because of what I just said about emissions keep rising and we, we're just way off track globally for, for hitting net zero. And so those commitments look a bit like pie, pie in the sky. And that tension kind of bubbled through in, in one particular meeting. And yes. you, this is some colour that is woven through the Bloomberg Big Take of the day. And it focuses on a, an, on a UBS banker. Yes, so there's a UBS banker called Judson Berkey. He essentially is their main guy for sustainable finance regulation. And there was a meeting in Tokyo held by the Financial Stability Board, which is a group of global regulators. Representatives from the Fed were there, the ECB. And he basically said, you regulators, your expectations of banks are way off track. You're asking us to align our lending, our portfolios with a 1.5 degree world. But the world itself is on track for 2.8 degrees or more. How can you possibly expect us to align with 1.5? It's ridiculous. And the way banks, big banks could do that, but if they were to do it, they'd have to basically divest all of their big clients. You could deliver a portfolio decarbonisation, but that's not helpful for real-world decarbonisation, which is what we need. Right. And I guess this takes us into the, the, the question of fees for banks, their clients you mentioned, and who they compete with. Because yes. it's, all very well, it's one thing if banks decided to do that, but then they would only hold the power to drive change, I suppose, if they were the only source of capital, the only source of funds. Step exactly. forward, the private sector, the private, uh, uh, private credit sector, pri uh, you know, th there are other places that businesses can go to get funding these days, and banks are going to be acutely aware of that. Exactly. There's a big argument that comes from the banks that says, if we divest from our heavy carbon clients, there are plenty of other people that can step in and take over from us. And we actually, because we've made these commitments, are kind of on the hook for having to deliver on them and are therefore more likely to push those high carbon clients to decarbonise. Whereas if you then have those same loans or that same financing go into the private markets where you have perhaps lenders with less scruples when it comes to climate or certainly have not made those commitments and perhaps are less caring, shall we say, on such topics, well, that can allow for emissions to grow in the private markets with less clarity, less transparency and less kind of, you know, no one really holding them accountable. And so that's a big problem here, or potentially a big Alistair, problem. Alistair, how big is our little violin on this when it comes to the banks? I mean, they made this commitment. We bring out the tiny violin for the bankers. They made these commitments. <laughs> they did, yes. Right? They made these commitments. They're not naive. They're smart individuals, men and women, working through this. Yes. Um, they made the commitments. Why are they su they're, they're suddenly doing the hand-wringing now. The other question is, there has to be a point where you make the cost of credit more expensive for the carbon-intensive industry, you make it cheaper for the renewables, and that's got to be part of the process. Yes, but a lot's happened since they made those commitments. Mostly, so they made most of those commitments with the 2021 era. 2022, we have the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis that's, that's come. And so a lot of the assumption that oil and gas was going to go away or was in terminal decline, mm -hmm. that's basically, that doesn't exist anymore. Those clients are profitable, very profitable. It's very hard to say, oh, we don't want to bank ExxonMobil anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no banking CEO willing to make that kind of move. And so... Yeah, we're in a very tricky position where there's a lot of money to be made on fossil fuels, but we also need to drastically move. If we had to have any chance of hitting the 1.5 degree target, action needs to happen today. So there's this real tension. Bloomberg's Alistair Marsh walking us through uh, that tension that we're seeing in the banks uh, with the energy transition. We thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. Coming up on the program, we speak to Wizz Air CEO and co-founder Joe Verratti on his outlook for the airline industry travel and more. It's a conversation you don't want to miss as we talk about the demand going into the summer season, the inflationary pressures, and of course those supply chain issues that you were seeing on both sides of the Atlantic. All of that and more coming up next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. So it's been a monster rally. Uh, that rally was mostly fueled by adoption, right? With the ETF, it made it very easy for people in the U.S. institutions and the wealth channel, most importantly, to access Bitcoin for the first time.
That was the Galaxy Digital founder and CEO, Mike Novogratz, on the Bitcoin rally. Certainly, it's been a really strong quarter for Bitcoin, for a host of other assets, for gold as well. Um, the focus of this, of a lot of our conversations this morning, Chrissy, has been around supply chains. And we're going to go into another conversation where that is important. We spoke earlier on to the CEO of Lloyds of London, and he was talking about the, uh, the impact on the insurance sector of one big supply chain issue, and that's mm. the collapse of that Baltimore Bridge. Yeah. Uh, but supply chain is certainly something that's really uh, dominant when you think about what's going on in the aviation sector right now, be it engines or the supply of aircraft. It is. And then also, I mean, dare I say, it actually connects to the Bitcoin story and the investing story here because some of those inflation concerns are actively driving the markets. There is a fundamental connection between inflation and alternative assets in private credit and in private equity in Bitcoin, uh, not to put those all together. Uh, but the inflationary story is important because take a look at where all the uptick is coming from. It's coming from demand that hasn't gone away, yeah. supply chain points that you mentioned. Um, and a lot of that, at least in the United States, if you break it down into the nitty gritty, it's coming from airfare. Yep. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So FS have been uh, certainly playing their part in that inflation story. Let's get into a conversation about the inflation, uh, the, the aviation sector then now. We're joined by the CEO of Wizz Air, Joseph Ferrandi, who's uh, passing through London this morning and with us. So very nice to speak to you. Uh, it's nice to have you with us. Let's look ahead to the summer. I know we've got all these supply chain issues to talk about and we'll get to that. But I just wanted to have a moment to think about where what the summer looks like, because I know, you know, you'll have people, network planners and uh, computers all, all focused on how strong bookings look for the summer. Um, I was looking at your load factor over the last few months and it did seem as if it had dropped year on year but I know you're growing what, uh, should we be concerned about that load factor drop what's going on there no not at all we uh, we see demand being very strong and intact and people want to fly um, to be honest I think uh, demand is a function of economic prosperity as the world is still doing relatively well of course we always want it to be uh, to, to be better so there is nothing wrong with demand the challenge to the industry comes on the supply chain side mm. OK, so let's go there then, shall we? Because uh, that's clearly uh, important. Let's start with the supply chain stories that do impact your business. And I want to, this is, of course, around the A320 family of planes grounded due to uh, Pratt & Whitney engine issues. Can you give us any update and thinking about the summer? Is the summer under threat at all because of the lack of availability of these aircraft? Yeah, so at the moment, we have around 20 percent of our fleet grounded as a result of uh, the Pratt & Whitney GTF engine inspection cycle. Uh, we try to mitigate that issue by extending existing aircraft operations, taking market leases. Also, we continue to take new aircraft deliveries. So as a result of that, uh, we are planning on flat capacity year on year going into, uh, into summer. So I think we have created some protective uh, layer with, uh, with, uh, with that regard. But this is a significant hiccup in the industry, unexpected. Uh, but by now, I think we are all fully on top of that. Uh, we have plans, we have models, uh, we have all sorts of compensation schemes in place, and operationally we are processing the, uh, the issue. It's going to take us a year or two uh, to fully go through this cycle, but I think we are on top of it. What's the most up-to-date time frame you're looking at for resolving the Pratt & Whitney engine issue? This is not going to go away too quickly. I mean, we are talking about two types of issues. Uh, one is uh, the engine technology is, is a brand new groundbreaking technology. As a result, you, you, you should be reasonably expecting some childhood diseases. And I think we are going through that cycle of childhood diseases. And on top of that, there was this industrial hiccup of contaminated materials, the, uh, the, the so-called powdered matter, which needs to be corrected and parts uh, are being replaced as we, uh, as we speak. Both lines, I think, will come to an end uh, in the next 18 to 24 months. What is the Boeing impact? You're, you're exclusively with Airbus, for now at least. The Boeing going through, of course, these momentous challenges, but it ripples across the sector in terms of the ability to churn out planes, to get planes to airlines. The impact on, on you as a business as you look ahead from what Boeing is going through, their travails. Yeah. For, first of all, we are happy to operate Airbus. We like the Airbus planes, and uh, we, we took a strategic decision why we were going for Airbus. Having said that, uh, we have an interest in a very strong Boeing. We want a competitive industry because competition drives economic efficiency in the industry and it drives innovation, and we, we need both uh, going forward. So uh, we want to see Boeing uh, to recover from this, uh, to, to become solid again, uh, and be a, a quality player in the, uh, in the industry. You talk about this kind of interest and, and ramifications for the broader industry. Talk to us about the capacity crunch there. Where is the bigger risk factor? Is it that demand has exploded in the way that it has, or is it the supply crunches? What, what's the bigger uh, hurdle for you? Yeah. To be honest, if you look at demand on a global basis, I mean, the whole industry globally is basically back to COVID level. Uh, so I don't think that this is the explosion of demand. 
uh, globally. It is the explosion of the supply chain globally. This is what's affecting the, uh, the operations of the industry. But that's pushing the airfares higher as well. And you're seeing that on both sides of the Atlantic. Talk to us about the airfare picture. When do you as a company address that or pull it down in line with the inflationary pressures that we're seeing? Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, airfares are the, the, the function of supply and demand. And if supply is contained, obviously, this is going to make an offer push on, uh, on airfares. Our business model, however, is to make sure that we derive the most economic efficiency from our operations and apply that saving to the consumers because we are still stimulating the market. I mean, let's not forget that in the United uh, Kingdom, it is a fairly saturated market, but you go to countries like Central Eastern Europe, uh, you are still stimulating first flyers. Uh, 30, 40 percent of our passengers are first flyers. They, they, they just flew uh, first time ever in their life. Wow. That's quite the experience. Um, let, let me, let, I just want to go back to some of the supply chain issues we were talking about with regards to Boeing. And you're saying it's important to have a strong brand. I find that interesting, given you don't use them as a, you know, you know not, a, not a customer, as, mm. as Tom said. Why is it important? For you, then, if, you, if, if you're not a customer of Boeing, that, that we have a strong Boeing in the marketplace. Yeah. Because I don't want anyone in this industry to uh, monopolize this market position because this is going to push prices up on the uh, airplane and it will slow down innovation. I think we need both. We need to have um, uh, good assets coming out uh, of the production line at reasonable price. And also we need to innovate this industry. I mean, you know, we have the carbon yeah. challenge and we need to make sure that the investments are... Uh, put up properly, and that is a, a, an innovative force driving the industry. So you don't want Airbus to put up prices? You don't want any of your suppliers, maybe? Of course maybe, I don't want. To, 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 to put up prices. <laughs> is there, to some extent, an argument that maybe you benefit, though, if, if, if Boeing customers are not able to get hold of their planes, for example, Ryanair, and you're in the same markets as them to some degree in various geographies. So do, do you benefit from their inability to get hold of the aircraft? Uh, look, if there are any benefits coming out of the situation, we'll, we'll take them. But we are in the long-term strategic game here. The interest strategically is to have a strong Airbus, a strong Boeing, strong players in the industry uh, operating pro uh, properly and delivering the right quality of products to the market. Mm. Safety and critical uh, quality issues, obviously, in, fo in focus at Boeing. Are you, are you completely and 100% reassured, reassured that, that Airbus has none of these issues? How, how confident are you in Airbus's ability to turn out quality aircraft? Well, we are. I mean, we are uh, deeply into the Airbus system. Uh, I mean, just look at it from this perspective. Every year, uh, we, we take roughly around 40 new aircraft deliveries. So we live and breathe together with, with Airbus. We understand our quality system, we understand the aircraft, and we are exposed to, uh, to new aircraft deliveries on a continuous basis. We are very confident. Regulators in, in the, are on it. Regulators are on it. I think IASA is doing a good job. Airbus is doing a good job. Um, uh, I think they are making the, uh, the necessary investments uh, needed in, in quality controls. I have full confidence. Full confidence, but is there something else you'd like to see from the regulatory authorities in terms of ensuring that safety and ensuring that consumer confidence as well? I think what we need to have, and, and maybe this is what uh, has eroded over the last few decades, that uh, due to the consolidation of the industry, the relationship between the regulator uh, and, the, uh, and the manufacturer became somewhat more cozy than what it should have been. Uh, these two lines must be totally separated out. The uh, manufacturer must control uh, internally quality of their products, and it has to be scrutinized and oversighted by the regulator in a separate manner. And those things should not be overlapped. Okay, so that's the regulatory story. Away from the supply chain issues, that, that there's something else I wanted to ask you about, and that is the way that we're sort of almost going back a few decades in the sense that some consumers want packaged holidays again, it seems. We've been writing about this at Bloomberg, and I know others have as well. But EasyJet is making profits in that area. Ryanair has deals in place to sell, you know, packaged holidays. With cost of living crises in various places, it's focused consumers on knowing exactly what they're going to have to spend up front. Are you doing anything in that space to make money on that, on that front? I think we are seeing conflicting trends, to be honest. I mean, uh, there may be a trend for uh, package holidays and there is another trend for unbundling and uh, people want to pick their choices, whether that's a hotel or logistics or, uh, or airfare. Uh, we are essentially enabling them to do both, uh, depending on consumer preferences. If people want to package up, they can do it on our website. They can do their own uh, holiday package. If they want to buy... Uh, various products separately, they can do it too. All right. Uh, a lot to digest there. We thank you so much for joining the program. That's Wiz Air CEO and co-founder Joseph Varadi joining the program this morning. Coming up, with the Germany set to partially legalize cannabis for personal use in the coming days, we're going to discuss the opportunities for the commercial market. That conversation next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back. It's 8.43 this Thursday. The markets today show, of course, continuing to keep across these markets for you. The European benchmark is actually up uh, two-tenths of a percent. So building on three straight days of gains. You've got fourth straight day of gain in progress right now. Fresh records set yesterday. It looks like we're going to add to that today. The FTSE 100 currently up three-tenths of a percent. The commodities lift coming through slightly for the FTSE 100. Over in France, the CAC also gaining three-tenths of a percent. And across your sectors, quickly having a look on how things are shaping up. Consumer products, energy, food and beverage, all at the top of the list in terms of what is happening. Uh, Travel and leisure, I should say. In fact, top of the list, again, of eight-tenths of percent. Consumer products are up seven-tenths of percent. Bottom of the list is construction off by four-tenths of percent. S&P minis are flat. NASDAQ futures are flat. Again, uh, fresh records on U.S. stocks yesterday, taking a bit of a pause, it seems, today. Let's get to the banking space now, where UBS has cut its bonus pool for last year by 14 percent. One four, 14 percent after a tougher year, of course, for dealmakers and traders. This as the Swiss bank increases its cost-saving target amid the integration of Credit Suisse. Annual profit came in at a record 27.8 billion US dollars. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf then, who leads our finance team for the details on this. Tom, Amotti's pay, Sergio Amotti's pay uh, in focus. Um, what does that number look like? Where does this rank among banking executives? Yeah, it's sort of around 15 million uh, euro mark, which puts them right at the top. Uh, of at least among the main European banking CEOs. Uh, you know, as we know, when you compare that to US bank CEOs, it's, it's relatively uh, thin. You know, you get someone at a Goldman or a city getting paid north of $25 million a year. But it just goes to show, I think, A, obviously, you know, the size and scale of the job ahead, but also the sense that, you know, it's perceived that the executives at UBS are doing a pretty good job of this integration, albeit, as they themselves have said, this year is the really tough year for, for this mammoth project of, of getting Credit Suisse completely absorbed into UBS. So you compared it to the U.S. banks as well, but talk to us a little about how it compares to European banks, given that the bonus pool is down about 14%. Yeah, so, you know, the bonus pool for all the, the traders and the, the deal makers is down. Uh, you know, there's been a bit of a mixed bag in Europe. So you've had some banks like a Unicredit actually boost their bonus pools, but largely for the sort of the really big players like a UBS and obviously in the UK at Barclays, we have seen that pool drop. 14% is, um, you know, uh, around about in line with, with those kind of lenders and, and just again speaks to that push by UBS to keep their costs down and the sense that, you know, Credit Suisse had a much more a more sizable investment bank, at least relative uh, to its kind of uh, entity size, and, and UBS is looking to shrink that a bit. Mm. Tom, it, it's a, this, this coming from an annual report, I think, where, you know, typically you, you find more in the, in the financial statements usually, don't you, about these businesses, but you've managed to glean quite a lot from, the, from this statement today. What else stood out to you? Yeah, there was a really interesting line that you've got to kind of read the tea leaves on, but, you know, a lot of speculation about how long Amotti is going to stay. And, you know, previously there was a sense he'd, he'd obviously stay through right till the integration is complete, which they're aiming for uh, by the end of 2026. But there was a line there, I think, from the chairman saying we expect Amotti to stay at least through then. So when you're reading those things carefully, that kind of wording, a bit like with central bankers, you know, you could read that as suggesting that Amotti's going to be there for, um, you know, longer than perhaps people were initially banking on. Tom, thanks so much. Tom Metcalf uh, bringing us the latest on the banking sector. Obviously, focus there on the pay at the top and the bonus pool and how that yeah. compares to the European competition. And I think when we, when we talk about the uh, banking sector as well, we have to put this in the context of something, the European interest rate story. Over and over again, we heard it from Commerce Bank, we heard it from others as well, uh, that if you're trying to talk about peak rates in Europe that have been kind of fueling this, these gains in the banks and fueling, therefore, bonuses and these kind of salaries, uh, what does that then mean for for mm. the uh, interest rate picture and therefore the banks broadly. Mm. OK, let's pivot firmly away from the interest rate picture. I can think of no linking sort. Europe's markets, markets on a high. Excellent. I, Thank you, Tom. <laughs> he should be doing this bit. <laughs> Europe's largest medical cannabis market, Germany, is set to partially legalise weed for personal use from next week. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook is at a medical marijuana growing and processing facility just outside Dresden. He's dressed for the occasion. He brings us a conversation on this front. Ollie, good morning. <laughs> 
That's right, Anna, away from interest rates. But rates of interest may be high in this story because we are one of the, the biggest growers here in Germany where um, there are only three companies that can legally grow cannabis here in Germany, and only one of them is a local German company, and that's Demican. And that's where we're standing right now, in their grow facility. And this comes as the law has been passed now that starting on the 1st of April, there's going to be a partial legalization, a decriminalization, and huge implications not only for the medical part of this uh, business, but, but the potential future commercial sales. So I'm very pleased to be joined right now by one of the managing uh, directors, Philip Goebel, who is here. Can you take Good us morning. first, what's going on in this room and a little bit about what the operation is here? This is one of our growing rooms where we currently grow uh, up to one ton per year, which we only can deliver up to now to the German government. As of Monday, we will be allowed to use the one ton of spare capacity we already have for grow, which we can then sell directly to the pharmacies. So we already can double our production here at this site. And we also have lots of expansion capacity when it comes to the point which you mentioned, the second column of the law, when, medical, uh, when cannabis will be allowed for recreational purpose as well within the test regions which are going to be defined. That's right. So those pilot program we're expecting maybe at the end of the year, the beginning of next year, and that will be selling directly to the public, which is really the game changer here because you are primarily and really only a medical producer right now. But really, there's a chance in the next couple of years that becomes the smaller part of your business. What do you expect for the timeline for the commercial sale? And illustrate a bit for us the scale of what we're talking about here. So the cannabis market in Germany is estimated to be between 420 and 770 tons. If you talk to paper producers, which are often used uh, to consume cannabis, they are rather expect 1,000 tons to be consumed in Germany. So this is interesting. I just want to make this point because it's very difficult to get data because this is obviously illegal. So you need to go exactly. to the manufacturers of rolling papers to get an idea of how much is being used in Germany. And the, the paper from the government for the 400 to 770 tons uh, was uh, taking assumptions from the U.S., from Colorado, from Canada, to estimate the German market size. So we see it's a huge potential market, knowing that the medical cannabis market is just right now about 12 to 13 tons. Still, however, the medical cannabis market over the next 12 to 24 months is expected to grow by 5 to 10 times. So you can see already the big potential within the medical market as a first step. And then when the recreational market steps in, this is obviously a huge growth opportunity as well, especially because within that second part which is going to come, everything which is going to be sold for recreational purposes has to be grown in Germany. And as you said, we are just one of the three licensed producers right now who can grow cannabis right, in Germany. So, so that positions you pretty well in the market here. Here's the question. Do you need to actually expand now to fill that capacity? <clears throat> Currently, we can serve two tons out of this facility for the medical market. And when it comes to that second part, we already have the expansion capacity foreseen. We have all the permits in place to quickly ramp up the business to serve that recreational part as well. Right, which is no small feat in Germany, as we've learned, and across a lot of different industries. And there's been a lot of hype, at least in the United States, in Canada with a lot of valuations for cannabis companies, much less um, here in Europe. So um, for you, what are you looking at in terms of speaking to investors? I assume you've got a lot of calls in the last few weeks. Totally true. Uh, so we are currently starting such a Series C with a CLA. So everyone who's interested, reach out to us. Um, so we are <laughs> doing this CLA now and then close our Series C over the time of this year to keep up ramping up the business in Germany where we see this huge growth potential, which is besides the growing part, which we already do here, uh, we have service lines where we serve other, other customers with pharmaceutical services to get their medicinal products to the market, as well as software solutions, which we developed for the pharmacies. So we really cover the full supply chain where we see the leverage of this market for the future. Right, developing really the cannabis ecosystem for the first time in, exactly, in Europe. Exactly, it's an ecosystem. And, but the Canadians are also at the door. They are growing here in Germany. How do you stay ahead of competition? Because a lot of the sort of overhead and a lot of the barriers to entry aren't that high from a physical standpoint. From a physical standpoint, that's right, but regulatory-wise, the hurdles are quite high because we are a pharmaceutical production company, so we adhere to the same standards <coughs> as the big pharmaceutical companies in the market, and that is a hurdle you first need to take. What we got to say as well is that what, with, of all the cannabis which is currently grown in Germany, we have 70% of market share, although we only got um, the smaller number of lots which we can produce, so we got three and the other ones got each five. So we see, as in German underdog to say so, we yeah. achieved to high quality standards and have more than 70% market share of that what is grown in Germany. And I'm curious to get also a little bit of an idea of your, uh, under your um, relationship with the government and how the government is trying to sort of treat this industry and how is it trying to encourage it or has it been, a, has it been difficult? 
<coughs> the, the government is really supportive to us, so we have two states in Germany who invested into the company as well. We got subsidiaries here from uh, the local state of Saxonia, 30%, which subsidize the assets here when we build up this facility because we have <coughs> done 70 people who are now working here at our company. We have implemented that. So we see good support also from the local and national governments. We are working very closely together with the beef farm, which is the FD in the US, where we have a good relationship to build up this business. Philip Goodball, thank you so much and for taking the time and for bearing this sort of uh, tropical climate that we have uh, in here in Demacan. So again, you know, this is a huge opportunity for these guys in the medical industry, but really for any of the investors and for the businesses that are looking into the future in Germany and in Europe, it's tapping into that recreational market, which as we were saying, you know, they're producing two tons here. We're talking about just for Germany, 450 to 750 tons. And across Europe, the estimates are if legalization were to proceed more broadly, it could be a quarter trillion dollar market. Bloomberg's Oliver Cook there walking us through some of the numbers. It's a really interesting story because you've seen it actually become a real uh, growth story in other parts of the world. Canada, for example, of course, getting a lot of gains. I think in the state of New York, uh, seeing that as well. Uh, in terms of watching some of the growth, let's talk about what else we're going to be watching in terms of today's data docket. At 12.30 UK time, we get U.S. fourth quarter GDP. That third reading mm -hmm. is going to be coming out. The initial jobless claims as well at about the same time. 2 p.m. UK time, UMish consumer sentiment data that March final reading hitting at about 2 p.m. there at 5.30 p.m. UK time. The focus shifts to Europe. The ECB's Villaroy speaking in Paris at about 6 p.m. UK time. U.S. Treasury market closing early for that Easter break. And of course, later today, Sam Bankman-Fried set to be sentenced for stealing billions of dollars from customers, marking the final chapter in the FTX case, which shook the crypto industry by storm. We're going to be live at the New York Federal District Courthouse, and you can catch our special coverage of Bloomberg Crypto from 4 p.m. London time onwards. You know, it's interesting when this uh, story first broke and we saw mm. the ramifications, there was an expectation that suddenly interest in the actual yes. crypto story... Institutional adoption would be affected. Right, and we've seen the exact opposite, <laughs> exactly. haven't we? In the same quarter as we are getting this sentencing, we also saw a record price on Bitcoin. Yeah, CZ, of course, from Binance, also pleading guilty in a case with investigators, at least the DOJ in the U.S., um, taking a bit of a knock uh, to, to Binance, one of the other big exchanges, of course. Yeah. But as you say, it has done nothing to quell the interest now that those approvals came through January the 11th from the SEC for the likes of BlackRock, Fidelity and those ETF products. The ETF story, of course, yeah. the driver and worth mentioning. Uh, so as we bring this programme to a close, I suppose for markets, there's the data that you mentioned, Critty, on the day book. But tomorrow yeah. is the key data point when possibly nobody will be looking. Yeah, that, that <laughs> And no markets will be trading, at least not on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, well, I think it may be, it may be a good thing this one time around, given your point earlier in the show, which is that people have been shrugging off this data over again, the CPI numbers, the PPI numbers, the PC deflator, and of course, Chairman Powell's comments, given mm. we've heard so many of his peers speak this week, starting with Raphael Bostic, mm. most recently, yeah. uh, the Fed's Waller. Yeah, so maybe post-Waller, it is a good thing that we have a little time to digest exactly what this uh, PCE data tells us. And of course, we'll get that uh, tomorrow when, as I say, markets are broadly closed. That is it for markets today. Uh, the European equity story is a slightly positive one, up by two tenths of one percent volumes no doubt a little depleted because of the market holidays coming tomorrow and in some cases in parts of europe next week as well so u.s futures flat to negative the pulse is up next this is blink Bank.